Good evening, everyone. I'd like to uh, call this meeting of the Sterling Heights City Council to order. Please stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for the invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Dear God, please bless our elected officials. Grant them courage and wisdom to do what is right for all citizens. Amen. 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 Thank you, Ms. Riska. Can we please have the roll call? <clears throat> Mayor Taylor? Here. Mrs. Sarasky? Here. Mrs. Kosky? Present. Mr. Radke? Present. Mrs. Schmidt? Present. Mr. Yanez? Here. And Mrs. Yarko? Present. Thank you, Council. We need approval of the agenda tonight. Mr. Mayor? Mrs. Kosky? Move to approve the agenda. And at the request of Mr. Radke, move consent agenda item 7C and 7G to consideration item 8A and 8B. Is there support? Support. It's been moved and supported. Uh, is there any discussion? Just to clarify, we're going to be moving consent agenda item 7C and we'll make that consideration item 8A. We'll pull. Uh, Consent agenda item 7G, and we'll make that 8B. With no further discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next item on our agenda is a report from our city manager, Mark Vanderpool. Mr. Vanderpool. Thank you very much, Mayor. I'm uh, very pleased to start out uh, this evening with a special recognition. And we have, uh, once again, County Commissioner Joe Romano, who's going to be presenting on behalf of the Macomb County uh, Board of Commissioners. And to set the stage for this presentation, I'd like to introduce our Police Chief, Dale Jawojikowski. Thank you, Mr. Vanderpool. Um, Again, most of you have already seen this video. I just wanted to check uh, one more time, but Officer Machieski uh, is kind of a famous celebrity here at Sterling Heights. Uh, had a very heroic uh, video of him saving the baby that you see in the video there or in the picture on the wall. Uh, the baby was only two years old when he saved her life um, out on Waltham Drive, approximately uh, 10, uh, 45 p.m. on July 9th. A uh, call came out that a baby was not breathing. Officer Machieski was right around the corner, as you can always count on your Sterling Heights officers to be. Uh, he made the scene quickly. As he pulled up on scene, the mother and the entire family ran out into the street with the lifeless baby. Officer Machieski, with his mask on, appropriately with his COVID mask, is just <laughs> awesome, goes out there, calms the whole family down, takes the baby, realizes the baby's choking, puts the baby down on his thigh, does back blows, dislodges some curdled milk, that was in the baby's airway, the baby coughs, the Sterling Heights Fire Department took over secondary care and saved the baby's life. Mom collapses to the ground, the dad is just beside himself, the family is just unbelievably thankful and appreciative. Um, and this was a few weeks later, they came into my office and that was the first time camera got to meet mom and dad and baby. Uh, so it was just a great event. And with that, I'll turn over the floor to uh, County Commissioner Romano. Thank you, Chief. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, Mr. Vanderpool, Mr. Kaszewski. On, be on behalf of the County Commissioners, I'd like to, uh, the Board of Commissioners, I'd like to make this proclamation for uh, Officer Cameron Machieski. It's a proclamation honoring Officer Cameron for his heroic efforts in saving a choking infant. Whereas the Board of Commissioners commends and recognizes the quick thinking and life-saving actions Officer Cameron displayed in coming to the assistance of a choking infant in Sterling Heights, Michigan. Whereas Officer Cameron calmly and professionally reassured the frantic family while he performed back thrusts in an attempt to clear the baby's blocked airway. The infant had lost consciousness while drinking milk from her bottle. Because of Officer Cameron's heroic actions, the infant quickly coughed up the obstruction and began to cry. 
an immediate sound of reassurance for her scared family watching over her. Whereas Officer Cameron prevented a potentially tragic outcome for the infant and her family, his quick life-saving actions are highly commendable and fits calm and professional manner is an enormous reassurance for any victim in a life-threatening situation as well as for other officers involved. Officer Cameron's excellent skills as an emergency responder, public service officer, will surely continue throughout his career, helping the community he personally serves and professionally serves. Now, therefore, it is proclaimed by the Board of Commissioners, speaking for and on behalf of all county citizens as follows. By all of these people present, the Macomb County Board of Commissioners hereby publicly acknowledges and commends Officer Cameron with deep gratitude and profound, profound appreciation for his heroic and life-saving actions in saving the life of a choking infant. Be it further resolved that a suitable copy of this proclamation be presented to Officer Cameron in testimony of the high esteem in which he is held by the Macomb County Board of Commissioners. It's signed by myself and Commissioner Harold Hall. Unfortunately, the other commissioners weren't available to sign it all, but it's all on their behalf. So, Officer Cameron, I commend you for it. I think that's the best I can do. <laughs> Mr. George. Mr. Mayor, Councilman, Mr. Vanderpool, um, I appreciate the uh, recognition. Um, it, it's great. There's, I strongly believe that any other police officer for the city of Sterling Heights that would have responded to this call would have handled it the exact same way. We're all very well trained. We're all timely, expedient, very professional, and I'm just glad that it resulted with this picture and not a, a sadder picture. So thank you again. Council, uh, it's with mixed emotions that I present the next topic. As you know, Fire Chief Chris Martin announced his retirement recently, and his last day on September 30th is rapidly approaching. Chief Martin has been with the Sterling Heights Fire Department for 31 years, rising through the ranks in the department to become chief eight years ago. He started with the department when he was just 22. The chief did not want me to say his age, but you can all figure it out now. <laughs> chief Martin's commitment to the safety of this community and dedication to the fire department over his career has been more than commendable. Our fire department is recognized throughout the state as one of the premier fire departments, and I would add one of the best in the country as well. This distinction of excellence is further validated by residents and businesses that have consistently ranked the Sterling Heights Fire Department in the 90 percentile in terms of satisfaction levels. These high marks are only possible through strong leadership in the department, including the fire chief. Chief Martin has not only continued the department's tradition of excellence, but has helped advance the department in a number of areas. I'm appreciative of Chief Martin's hard work, dedication, and his contribution to the entire organization over his long career, especially during the years as chief. <clears throat> While I could go on and on, I'd like to pause here, knowing that the Mayor and City Council would like to express their gratitude as well. So Mayor, back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vanderpool. Uh, I'm gonna open it up to my colleagues on the city council who I'm sure have uh, words that they want to uh, say about uh, Chief Martin. And uh, we, we probably don't have enough time tonight to express all of our feelings, but I'm gonna try to summarize it through this proclamation, um, a mayoral proclamation. And I make this not just on behalf of myself, I make it on behalf of my colleagues on the city council and really on behalf of the entire uh, city of Sterling Heights, who's benefited uh, immensely from Chief Martin's leadership. This is a proclamation for and on behalf of the city of Sterling Heights, the city council, recognizing and thanking the fire chief, Chris Martin, 
for a distinguished career of dedication and commitment to the public service as a member of the Sterling Heights Fire Department. On September 30th, Christopher Martin will conclude his tenure as Fire Chief of the City of Sterling Heights Fire Department and bring an end to a distinguished 31-year career in the fire service for the City of Sterling Heights. Starting in 1989 with an appointment as firefighter, Chris Martin rose steadily through the ranks within the Sterling Heights Fire Department and achieved his career goal, becoming Fire Chief in December of 2012. Along his career path, Chief Martin exemplified the traits that would be the hallmark of his career, including dedication, professionalism, hard work, and leadership. During his eight-year tenure as Fire Chief, Chief Martin applied these traits to achieve many significant departmental objectives, including spearheading the implementation and operation of the Advanced Life Support Transportation Services within an extremely tight time frame. Designed and implemented the first ever Knox Box system for the city providing assured access into commercial facilities for fire department personnel responding to emergency events. Developed a peer and therapeutic support service for the fire department personnel impacted by traumatic events. Provided community outreach, outreach essential to the voter approved safe streets millages that provided critical funding to fire department operations. He oversaw departmental improvements required to reduce the fire department's ISO rating from a four to a two, which was the best of any fire department in the state of Michigan, and assures residents pay less in property insurance premiums. He implemented a survival coin program that unites survivors of cardiac events with Sterling Heights paramedics that rendered life-saving cardiac care. He oversaw a voter-approved capital uh, improvement program that renovated and upgraded the city's fire stations. And this is just to name a few of the many, many things Chief Martin has done as chief of this great fire department. In the end, Chief Martin's enduring legacy will be his unwavering commitment to being there to protect and serve those in need at the most vulnerable of times. Chief Martin's career embodies the wisdom of these words. No time is better spent than that spent in the service of your fellow man. So therefore, be it proclaimed that I, Michael C. Taylor, Mayor of the City of Sterling Heights, for and on behalf of the City Council, recognize and thank the Fire Chief Christopher Martin <clears throat> for a distinguished career of dedication and commitment to public service as a member of the Sterling Heights Fire Department. Chief Martin, God bless you. Congratulations. Now, Chief, before you come up here, because I do want to present this to you, and I got, I got an email about this that says that I can present this to you down there, but there's no hugging. Now, I know you and I, whenever we get together, there's a lot of hugging going on, right? So <laughs> thank you for that, Mr. Vanderpool. We do want to be conscientious of the uh, climate that we're in, but I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues right now. I have some things I want to say, too, but I'm going to open it up to the City Council. Any thoughts, comments, words of congratulations for Ch Chief Martin as he embarks on his retirement coming up shortly. Council, anyone? Mrs. Uh, you want me to Mrs. Start? Well, whoever wants to start. I'll start. It's, it's easy now because all you have to do is take off your mask. That means I know. you want to talk. It's the easy part. And I know I get a, get a second chance if I can think of something else because I'm starting out. Okay. Um, first of all, it's, um, it's a bittersweet moment. It really is because um, Chris has not only been uh, a faithful servant to the residents of this community, he certainly has been a partner in what um, we've done as a council and administration. And this happened even before he was chief, is that we've always had a good working relationship. And I had to write things down because I knew I was going to have the opportunity to speak. So I'm going to go back and forth with my notes. Um, we worked together for many years, and it's with your progressive thinking you were able to move the department for, war, forward during some difficult times. Your passion for your profession hasn't gone unnoticed by the council, the administration, and most importantly, by our residents. It can be said that you were a teacher to all of us. You accepted every challenge that were presented to you, and in some cases, you had a solution to a problem that might present itself. For sure, you will be missed um, throughout the city. Your professionalism, your commitment, and your love for your city will certainly be missed. Um, it doesn't matter what adversities you were faced with. You were professional, dedicated, 
and the love for residents shown through in all of your work. Um, but you can run, but you can't hide because we know where to find you. So best of luck. I'm sure we'll see each other again. Looking forward to actually um, having some really good conversations uh, now that you're not working for us. So, um, so anyway, um, good luck to you. And I'm going to miss Kelly, too, because I have to tell you, she's a fun up person. And when we're together, we always have a good time. <laughs> Council, anyone else? Mrs. Costi. Thank you. Chief Martin, I wrote my notes, too. Thank you for your excellent leadership and dedication to our fire department. The department has had many achievements under your leadership and direction for improvement. One of my goals was the ALS transport service, which you helped implement. I should say, you did it. In your years as chief, you have worked to make our fire department the premier department in Michigan. It is known all over Michigan. There our reputation, and you created that. Thank you for your service to the city and residents, and I wish you much success in your next endeavor, or I should say, next challenge, because I know you love challenges. And I want to say you have done a tremendous time, or tremendous improvements with that department and made us number one in the state of Michigan. And it looks like, uh, Chief, you and I have been here the same length of time. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, and I wish you well, because I know that you're going to enjoy your future. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Koski. Anyone else, Council? Sure. Mrs. Schmier Taylor. <sighs> Chief Martin, I remember having breakfast with you saying, I'm not sure about you. I'm not sure you were the right one for this position. And boy, did you prove me wrong. And I'm glad. Over the years, yeah, here I go. <laughs> um, you know, there's some words that come to mind when I think of Chris Martin, and that's integrity, energy, hardworking, forward thinking, never afraid to think outside of the box. Never. I don't think your mind ever shuts off. Kelly, I'm not sure how you live with that. <laughs> um, always, always, always looking out for the residents and the business owners and the safety of all of us in this city and also the men and women of his department. They were a priority. They are your priority. And you made that very clear to us. Um, as a lifelong resident, you've been dedicated to this city. It shows. It shows that you love this city, and that's, I think, what made part of your job so successful. Um, I just want to thank you for everything. Thank you for your friendship, for all the conversations we've had, um, the knowledge that you've given me about fire service, and um, I want you to really enjoy your, your retirement. You deserve it, you, you've earned it, and I'm sure this isn't the end for you, but uh, I wish you nothing but the best, Chris. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Schmidt. Mrs. Sarosky. Thank you, Mayor Taylor. Um, okay, Chief Martin. Uh, I can't echo enough the words that my fellow council people have said. There are there are many words to describe you. And of course, we wrote down, you know, we all think the same and it's wonderful that we do. You have concern for the residents and your fellow firefighters that are, were under your tutelage. You have care and compassion, true grace under duress, but above all professionalism. And those things will, uh, that's about your character and your integrity, which you have tremendous amounts of both. We're gonna miss you very, very much in this position. I don't think, because you are the true leader, the real, the leader of this department that I don't believe can be topped. And we're gonna miss you. Thank you for everything you've done. Thank you, Mr. Roski. Mr. Radke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Chief Martin, congratulations on your retirement. We're going to miss you, but I know that you're gonna have a lot better time than working for us in retirement. Now, public service is a thankless job, and you've done that for 31 years. You've served the residents, you've served the council, 
You've made our city the premier place to live in the state of Michigan. I want to thank you for that. Um, now we're, we're always measured by the legacy we leave behind. I know everyone on council, we think about this every day. How can we make the city better? And you've done it for 31 years. And the fire department is the premier department in the state because of the work that you've done. You can leave, walk out the door at the end of the month and say, I left this better than when I found it. And so few of us can do that. And I want to congratulate you on that. Um, your leadership made our department great. We will miss you, but I hope you enjoy your retirement. I'm sure we'll see you around. You're still a resident. And I'm sure now, like Mrs. Zarko said, you'll have the freedom to really tell us what you think. So congratulations. I wish you the best. If you need anything, please come see us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Radke. Anything, Mr. Yannis? I, th I think, Mr. Mayor, that the, the proclamation really says it all. I mean, the, uh, um, there's nothing greater than service to your fellow man. And, and Chief Martin has sent, spent many, many years starting with the Detroit Fire Department and coming from a history of, of public servants. Um, I will say, I will just say this. Uh, thank you for everything you did. Um, everything is greatly appreciated. Um, and there is nothing like retirement. So enjoy it. <laughs> thank you, Council. Um, Chief, you know, I don't even know where to begin. I will say this. One of the things I liked uh, a lot about you is that uh, I don't think I need to wait for retirement for you to tell me how it is. You told it how it is. You, uh, you led the department based on facts of the situation. I believe that you always did what you felt was right for the city, for the residents of this city, and, uh, and you are a resident of this city. And you've always been invested in the city of Sterling Heights. And it's hard to imagine a uh, city of Sterling Heights Fire Department without Chris Martin. Um, I remember, I think the first time that I, my first memory of you, Chief, was at uh, one of the forums that we had when I was first on council where we were talking about uh, raising the millage to support services in the city. And you weren't there as a, a firefighter. I think you were there as a resident of the city of Sterling Heights. Um, and that sort of background, I think, is really invaluable in a position of leadership like yours. People's greatest investment is usually their house. Um, and the thing that's most important to them is their family. And that was what the fire department, that is what the fire department is there for, to protect our property, to protect our life. And there's not a city or a fire department in the state of Michigan or in the entire United States, as far as I know, that does a better job of that, uh, that core service than the Sterling Heights Fire Department. As long as I've been mayor, you've been our chief. And as long as I've been associated with Sterling Heights, we've had the best fire department in the state of Michigan. I don't think it's a coincidence, Chief. You're gonna be uh, sorely missed. I think that your leadership has been uh, exemplary, and uh, I congratulate you for everything that you've done. You're a man that can leave this city with your head held high, knowing that you improve the quality of life for countless people. And what we do a lot of times is we try to make quality of life better so that you know they have a better, they have a better you know, commute home from work, or that they have something to do in a local park. What you did day in and day out for over 30 years was make sure that, that if that person stopped breathing, that they were revived as quickly as possible so that they can continue to live. And through your uh, Survivor Coin program, we saw the, the results of the work that you and the men and the women of the fire department did. So Kelly, Chris, congratulations to both of you. Uh, God bless you both. Thank you for your service to the city of Sterling Heights. And if you'll join me, Chris, I'd like to present you with this proclamation and ask you to uh, share some words before you leave. Thank you.
bring this mic. I saw the police chief up here a minute ago. Yeah, um, thank you very much for those kind words. Um, you know, this has been such a ride. Excuse me. So, the um, first 23 years was just awesome. Got to do those things that, you know, every firefighter dreams of. I learned a lot from the people I worked with. I learned a lot with people I worked with. I hope I taught some of them uh, as I was growing and going through the ranks. So, and then eight years ago, uh, it wasn't the exact same council, but most of you are the same. Uh, you trusted me to become your fire chief, and I got to be leader of one of the best organizations I've ever seen. Uh, that was a very proud moment for me. It's been pride every minute since, and it will be very hard to leave uh, in two weeks. So, excuse me again. Um, I have you to thank for supporting me, city management, all the other friends I've made in the city. But without a doubt, my wife, Kelly, who has been with me since the day I got the card saying that uh, I was going to be a firefighter, she was with me the whole way. So she's my biggest supporter. Uh, my son, Max, and my family, they've been there for this ride, and it's been awesome. So uh, all this stuff is because she's allowed me to do it, and I wouldn't be here without her. So um, thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you um, when I'm not wearing this uniform and we can have some, some good conversations. <laughs> um, again, thank you very much for the kind words. This has been a, an awesome ride, and I will look back, as many of you said, and know that um, the things I did were great for this organization and for this city, and I'll have a lot of pride with that. So thanks again, and uh, have a good evening. I have nothing else to report on this evening. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, one item of housekeeping. Um, there is a black town and country minivan that had its door open outside. I think a resident closed it. It does not appear to be locked though. So if you wanna go check on that, um, it's a black town and country minivan. Um, we'll move on to the next item on our agenda tonight, which is a report from our, or I'm sorry, which is a presentation. And normally we would have a dinner um, honoring the uh, yearly diversity <clears throat> distinction awards, a banquet uh, that would honor our awardees and have a nice ceremony. Um, and unfortunately we are not able to do that this year, but um, we do not want to uh, skip over that entirely. Uh, this is a, a proud night and one of the best nights I think for our city council to look forward to and our community to look forward to it's always a great event. Uh, so we're gonna have a scaled down version of that right here and right now. So to help us out with the 2020 Diversity Distinction Awards, I'm gonna turn it over to our Community Relations Director, Melanie Davis. Ms. Davis. Thank you so much. It's a tough act to follow. Uh, congratulations again to Chief Martin and good evening to Mayor Taylor and members of council. It gives me great honor and privilege to bring to you tonight several individuals and organizations in our community who are doing exceptional work in promoting understanding of different cultures, ethnic and religious backgrounds, demonstrating not only acceptance, but appreciation for all cultures in their everyday lives, recruiting or advancing people of diverse backgrounds at their place of employment, or incorporating workplace diversity into organizational goals and performance measures. Simply put, they have shown an unwavering commitment to diversity and understanding in our community. But we wouldn't be able to highlight the achievements of these individuals without the commitment and dedication of the members of our very own Ethnic Community Committee. These individuals go above and beyond to promote, secure, and vet the nominations for our annual Diversity Distinction Awards each year. And we owe them, too, a debt of gratitude for the time and the care that they take in continuing to provide an exceptional quality of life for all of our residents here in Sterling Heights. And from that group, here to kick off this year's, albeit altered version of our Distinction, Diversity Distinction Awards, 
I'm pleased to introduce the chair of our Ethnic Community Committee, Mr. Willie Duchavez. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Again, my name is Willie Dishavez, the chairperson of the Sterling Heights Ethnic Community Committee. Tonight, it gives me a great pleasure to present our 2020 Diversity Distinction Awards. The Sterling Heights Ethnic Community mission is to provide the cities to promote i mean the city's rich diversity and to build a bridge of cultural understanding among our residents one of the ways to achieve this goal is through this annual award ceremony where we honor those who champion diversity and showcase those who have made an impact on Sterling Heights' overall quality of life. The Ethnic Community Committee welcomed nominations from citizens who wish to recognize a person, organization, or corporations that serves residents of this city and the surrounding community. The committee members juried the submitted nominations and select five award winners that met and excelled in a variety of criteria, including promoting an understanding among city residents of different cultural and ethnic backgrounds. I would like to thank all of the ethnic community committee members. They are here tonight for their dedication to this program. If I mention your name if, and you are here, kindly raise your hands, but I would like to mention all the nine members so you will know who the membership makes the committee. Mohamed Alumari, Abbot Basal, Joseta El Sini, Susan Katula, Abol Patwari, Igmal Singh, John Taylor, Carmen Williams, and Stacy Adams. A special thanks to Sue, our committee city liaison, for her outstanding job of putting this event together. Let's give Sue a big hand up. I would like to introduce the Ethnic Community Committee member, Sharon Allen, who will present our next award. I wondered why you left her out, Willie. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's because she got her own special recognition. Well, Miss Allen. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I would like to um, present this award to Ted Abston, a resident of Sterling Heights. Ted is a senior consultant with the Leadership Group LLC, working with various nonprofit organizations on projects involving community engagement, fundraising, consulting, diversity and inclusion assessment and training, team building, just to name a few. He is a member of the Baha'i Faith and co-founder of the Baha'i Justice Society. Ted has served as president of several nonprofits, including the International Institute of Metro Detroit, Model of Racial Unity, Inc., and the Detroit Metropolitan Bar Association Foundation. In addition, Ted has several diversity training certificates. 
has published six articles of diversity and has co-facilitated diversity and inclusion workshops for nearly 30 years. Ted had the honor of once hosting Rosa Parks for Thanksgiving dinner in his home, where his home was a safe house for a professor and his team as they relieved, relived the trip of a slave in the Underground Railroad. I am honored to present this Diversity Distinction Award to Ted Anson. Next, I would like to introduce Stacy Williams, who will present our next award. Hi, it is my honor to present this award to Malcolm Charles, a resident of Sterling Heights. Malcolm is currently a freshman at Michigan State University. Malcolm participated in freshman mentoring program during his senior year at Sterling Heights High School. And as a member of the National Honor Society and leadership program throughout his years at Sterling Heights until he graduated in 2020. Malcolm founded Stomp Racism after an incident occurred where he felt that there was an opportunity to create change in his school and community. Stomp Racism is a student-led group in Warren Consolidated School District, which has nearly 100 members. They provide opportunities for students to learn cultural competency, advocacy, and impacts of racism within our society. In addition, Malcolm has been involved in the Sterling Heights Drug Free Coalition, specifically the Smart Moves program where he acts as a role model in the classroom and discusses the importance of making healthy decisions and peer pressure. In the month of June 2020, Malcolm also organized a peaceful protest in front of the Sterling Heights Public Library, which he invited students and community members from all over to come together to remember the lives of families who were impacted by racial discrimination or police brutality and the shine and to shine a light on the importance of this to um, youth. For these reasons and more, I am very honored to present Malcolm Charles with this award. award. Um, Mal Malcolm right now is enjoying his um, freshman year at Michigan State um, University and everybody heard how they're all quarantined. So um, I'll, um, <laughs> we'll, um, give this word to um, Malcolm during a holiday break or um, make other arrangements. So um, he wasn't able to come to um, accept the award. It's still my um, honor. And um, <laughs> next um, presenting award is Cosetta Exeni, who will um, present our next award. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Mr. Steven Slensing is the principal at Shushard Elementary School and has been a part of Utica Community Schools for over 24 years. Out of 630 students of this school, 85% live in a home where is a second language, where is a, a second language is spoken. 70% being Arab and or Chaldean. During his six years at Shushard, the school has received multiple awards, which is why he chose to honor the entire st staff with this award. Shushard was named as a reward school by the state of Michigan in two areas, overall growth and beating the odds. Shushard was also named as a national Title I Distinguished School Award finalist for the state of Michigan. 
Mr. Steven Slensnik and his staff has spent several years focusing on cultural proficiency and what it means to truly respect and celebrate other cultures. They have worked hard to raise awareness about the issues of, of equality, diversity, and inclusion throughout the school and the entire city of Sterling Heights. They strive to surpass the idea of tolerance and focus on celebrating and using their diversity to make Shushart a better school. In 2019, Shushart Elementary School held their first ever cultural celebration day which was an incredible success with parents, students, staff, and participants. Through, read through readings and discussion with community experts, Shushart staff members concentrated on strategies and ideas that would improve the education of all 630 students of this school. During the nomination process, Mr. Slancic said that all of the successes and the progress that Shushart has made is due to the efforts of his entire staff as a whole. It is with great pleasure that I present this Diversity Distinction Award to Mr. Steven, St Steven Slancic and the entire staff of Shushard Elementary who spends every day making a difference in the student lives. I would like to <clears throat> thank everybody, um, the City of Sterling Heights, the Ethnic Community uh, Committee for um, giving us this award. I actually have a few people that I'd like to <clears throat> excuse me, introduce that uh, from the Shushard staff. Um, if you guys would stand. Um, we have Alina Sanawi, who is a fifth grade teacher at Shushard. Sumi Lee, who is our art teacher at Shushard. <laughs> Allison Bigelow, who is our math consultant at Shushard. <clears throat> and Amy Elzaheni, who is a third grade teacher at Shushart. Mm -hmm. And then we also have with us our interim superintendent, Bob Monroe, from uh, our board office. So oh, yeah. please give them a round of applause. <laughs> and I want to thank the, the city. It, it makes it uh, much easier for us knowing that you guys celebrate diversity like we do. So I, I appreciate that. And I'm going to tell a quick story. Uh, Malcolm Charles, who was not here to receive his award, but was my student at both McGehe and Havel. Um, so he went to Utica schools and then switched over to Warren Kahn. So it's kind of a, a really nice uh, night for me, not only to uh, be honored, and I'm, I'm very proud of Shushard, but I'm also very proud of being Malcolm's principal and all the things that, that he has went on to accomplish. And I'll tell you the, the quick difference I was thinking about um, with Malcolm, you know, a lot of schools would say, look around and say, where's the next Malcolm Charles? How can we find the next Malcolm Charles in a student who celebrates diversity like he does? And what Shushart does is we say, what can we do to make every student a future Malcolm Charles? So that's really the difference with our staff. So thank you again. We appreciate this very much. The next person will be uh, our chairperson, Willie De Chavez, to um, introduce the next award. This will be our next awardees. Two years ago, I wanted to nominate this two youth, what? I hold on to it because I said they are still very young and they cannot even carry the weight of the trophy. So I waited <laughs> another two years. Okay. James is 11 years old and Makala is age eight, began their community service and volunteerism at a very young age. Both resides in Sterling Heights and enjoy using their spare time, talents, and skills to contribute to the efforts to promote cultural diversity by participating in various events such as the City Sterling Festival and Cultural Exchange for the past four years. 
JM and MJ, as we fondly call them, have also attended the city's annual diversity dinners where they serve as models to showcase appreciation of their Filipino heritage and culture. In addition, both attended the Memorial Day parade displaying the Philippine flag while wearing the Philippine outfit. They have also participated in countless celebrations in events such as the Asian Cultural Heritage Day in Lansing, the Cultural of Asia Pacific Americans, and Filipino-American Friendship Dinners. They perform at the DIA, the Detroit Institute of Arts, during the Filipino History Month of October. Both made a video on the Census 2020 to encourage the youth to be counted. They also made a video to encourage others to apply for U.S. citizenship. Both are honor students and active members of their charts. JM is a star basketball player at school, and NJ is a ballet and Hawaiian dancer. I would like to acknowledge the proud parents of MJ and JM, James O and Michelle O, both over there, <laughs> and Grandma Rose Franco over there. Can you stand up, please? That's the grandma. They support both of them. <laughs> James and Michaela have the unique distinction as the youngest members of the Michigan chapter of the United States Filipinos for Good Governance, that's my organization, and the youngest persons to receive this Diversity Distinction Award. I am more than proud to present James and Michaela O their award. You know, they have something to say, so <laughs> let's listen to them. Good evening. My name is James Matthew. And my name is Michaela Julia. We are very honored to receive this prestigious award. This recognition that you give us will be remembered for a lifetime. Priceless. Rose, we would like to thank our organization, USP4GG, -G, headed by Mr. William Chavez, for giving us the opportunity to participate in so many activities for the past four years. We love to perform and join fun events. Our parents always encourage us to participate and Participate in community events. And, and we can't yeah, refuse our, our mom. mom. Our mom is our choreographer at that year. <laughs> and and Lola 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 is our manager. manager. Thank, Thank you, mom, mom, dad, family, and, and friends. friends. We both did a video on the Census Count 2020 so all the children like us will be counted in our Filipino language. But I have a very important message to all. Please don't forget to vote on the four and four hundred proposals on November third. <laughs> <laughs> I my brother's message. Good evening. Magandang gabi sa inyo lahat. Salamat. Thank you and God bless everyone. <laughs> And that concludes the presentation award. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Willie D. Chavez. Um, we're lucky to have you in your uh, role and all of the members of the Ethnic Community Committee. We thank you for your service to the city of Sterling Heights and for highlighting uh, these exceptional uh, efforts by these individuals, and children, and school. And I want to thank you once again for uh, all your leadership and help in uh, making Sterling Heights a better place for all of us to live. That will move on to the next item on our agenda, which is the consent agenda with the omission of items. I'm sorry? Isn't there a motion? Oh, you know what? There is a motion. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Koski. So there is an action to um, recognize and congratulate. Is there a council member who'd like to make that motion? Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Srowski. Resolved to individually and collectively recognize and congratulate the 2020 Sterling Heights Diversity Distinction Award winners and thank them for their commitment to and efforts in championing, championing diversity within the city of Sterling Heights. Support. It's been moved and supported. Is there any discussion? Just very briefly, congratulations to all. I'm so sorry we couldn't have a normal, regular celebration like we usually do, but next year, fingers crossed, we'll get there. So thank you again for all that you do. Council, anyone else? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Radke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to congratulate and thank everyone who participates with our Ethnic Advisory Committee and the Diversity Distinction Awards. It shows just how great the volunteerism is in Sterling Heights, and I just want to thank them again. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Radke. Council, anyone else? No further discussion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Now we will move on to the next item on our agenda, which is the consent agenda with the omission of item 7C and 7G. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on any item on tonight's consent agenda? If not, uh, I just want to make a brief comment. Uh, consent agenda item 7I is to approve payment of legal fees incurred in preparation of the regional managed assigned council coordination office report. This is a 100% grant funded item. The city of Sterling Heights is receiving funds in order from the state of Michigan as trustee to pay them out to two law firms that performed work on behalf of the state of Michigan. Um, my law firm, Kirk Huth Lang and Battlemente is one of the two firms receiving approximately $15,000. Um, the, Law, our law firm was chosen uh, not by the city of Sterling Heights, but by the state of Michigan, I believe. And again, these funds are not coming from the city of Sterling Heights. Um, and lastly, these funds will not benefit me directly in any way. Uh, with, with that being said, I am going to abstain from voting on 7I, just to confirm, 7I. So I will be voting on the consent agenda but abstaining on 7i, so I want to place that on the record. So, Council, um, can we have a motion? Mr. Mayor. Mrs. Koski. Move to approve the consent agenda as amended. Support. It's been moved and supported with no discussion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries with one abstention on item 7i being mine. Move on to the next item on our agenda tonight, which is consideration item 8A, and this is item 7C from the consent agenda, to purchase watch guard, in-car, and body video camera systems, and a Dell server expansion for the Sterling Heights Police Department, total cost of $237,703, less $58,500 in anticipated grant funding. We do have a presentation tonight from our police chief Dale Dwojakowski, Chief Dwojakowski. Thank you, Mayor Taylor. Okay, PowerPoint's up and running. Um, this has been a big night for us, the police department. We've talked about body cameras uh, for quite a while. We actually did a, um, a survey or a study back in 2016 about the feasibility of body cameras. At the time, it was kind of a take a wait and see approach. And just to kind of let you know what was going on. 2016 wasn't that long ago, but in 2016, no agency in Macomb County had body cameras. So to, now you see videos all day, every day of departments with body cameras. They are still relatively new. The technology is finally here. 
Uh, the price is finally correct for what you're getting, and I feel now is the time to move forward. And with that, I want to explain why body cameras in general, what that adds to our operational capacity, um, the pros, the cons, and there are some cons, and uh, the project itself and how it's going to lay out. Let's see if I can... There we go. I think you can just forward mark. So why body cameras? Um, the biggest thing is transparency, right? Every day in the news now, you're seeing a video of something that happened on the streets. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. Uh, Officer Machieski's incident, good video. And there's some other videos that have not been good for law enforcement. And other videos that, at first, the incident seemed to be one thing, but then in getting the body camera footage, completely changed people's minds after seeing the body camera footage. So transparency, transparency, transparency is what body cameras bring. Um, increased civility, the, the civilizing effect. And this is a big one. When someone thinks they're being recorded, right now we have microphones on our belt, but wait till a camera is mounted right to the center of an officer's chest. There is a mutual agreement amongst most parties when you're being videotaped that you're gonna be on your best behavior. That's good for the officer, and it's good for the citizen or the person we're having the encounter with. Everyone is on their best behavior. Just like at casinos, we all know there's cameras literally in every inch of a casino. That's why there's relatively little crime inside of a casino floor, because you're probably going to get caught. So the civilizing effect, knowing that you're on camera, helps reduce tensions and maybe becomes more civil process between the officer and the person they're dealing with. Uh, quicker resolution to complaints. Um, we have complaints that come in. Uh, we don't get that many of them in Sterling Heights, thank God. But when they do come in, we rely on the in-car camera footage, which is the camera that's mounted to the windshield of the car and the officer's butt, the microphone that's mounted to their belt. However, when they go into a house or they go out of the frame of the front windshield of the car, we don't know exactly what happened. Uh, we have audio sometimes from the microphone, but we have two versions of events, the, the person making the complaint and the officer. And the truth sometimes lies in the middle. Uh, so again... Um, having that video is going to really help us with our internal complaint process. Uh, enhancing evidence collection and prosecution, yes, absolutely. So many of these cases, the officer has to go on the stand and talk about why uh, they did what they did and what arrests they made. Well, now we can introduce this body camera footage, and now we have footage of what the officers saw. And the last one is training opportunities. When we do something that's not correct or something that had a you know, bad outcome, we can use that video and correct future engagements or whatever the officer did that needed some correction. The 2016 study they talked about, uh, uh, they did a lot of research on this and the, the, the answer back then was to take a wait and see approach. And these were the five reasons why. No legislative mandates or requirements. We thought for sure in the last four years there would be a mandate from the state or from the federal government that says you have to have body cameras. They have not done that yet probably because they don't want to pay for it. With a mandate comes the, the mandate to also pay for that, right? Because unfunded mandates are terrible. So we haven't seen that yet. Um, and there's been no state or federal money. Uh, technology improvements every year and costs decrease. Yes, just look at your phone, look at any piece of electronics that you have every year. The technology gets better and it decreases in, in price. And we're seeing that with body cameras. Um, only a minority departments have body-worn cameras and that was true back uh, in 2016, not a single agency in Macomb County even had body cameras. Now, nation nationwide, about 50% of agencies, larger departments are more likely to have them, small departments less likely to have them, but around 50%, maybe a little bit below that nationwide. So still, not every department has body-worn cameras. Um, and then back in 2016, no great pressure from the community to add body-worn cameras. We already had cameras in the car, really no one asking, no one saying, oh, we need body cameras, we demand it. It's changed a little bit in the last few months here in the United States. Uh, current research, there's a couple of um, uh, big studies, especially the one out of uh, Arizona State, researched all a bunch of departments, a do dozen different departments with body-worn cameras, and they found that the officers were more productive in terms of making arrests, had fewer complaints lodged against them um, relative to officers without body-worn cameras, and had a higher uh, number of citizen complaints resolved in their favor. And that's what we're seeing. Departments with body-worn cameras, when you do the complaint, you finally get the video, 90 plus percent of those complaints are resolved in the officer's favor. Um, we're seeing that across multiple agencies that have body cameras. Uh, another study, Rialto, California, was the number one place in, uh, they were one of the first agencies to get body-worn cameras. So this is a famous study as far as body-worn cameras, but they noticed uh, the same exact uh, decrease in citizen complaints after officers were wearing body-worn cameras and a decrease in use of force instance by police. 
Again, police officers knowing they're being recorded and the public knowing that they're being recorded reduces everyone's tension. And the last, again, another Arizona study, uh, officers with body-worn cameras are more cautious about their actions. They're sensitive to possible scrutiny of video footage by their superiors. Also, contrary to initial concerns, officers who wore cameras were found to have higher numbers of self-initiated contacts with community residents than officers that did not wear cameras. The cost of the program, um, the Body-worn camera has multiple parts. It's a DVR, like a computer that gets mounted in the trunk. It's an overhead display unit with a touch screen. It's wireless receivers, transmitters, Wi-Fi pickups. It is a lot of parts. And the body-worn camera is just a part of many pieces that make people say, why does it cost so much? Because you have to buy all those parts to make it work. A system without a body-worn camera costs about $5,100. That's with a microphone monitor belt, but if you want the camera version, it goes up to $5,900, so about $800 additional cost. So not that much to upgrade, and all of our units, all 60 of our cars are out of warranty right now, and they all need to be replaced. So this is the right time to do it. So why not replace a $5,100 unit with a $5,900 unit and get the body camera attached to that? And that's what we're gonna be doing as we rotate out these older units that are no longer under warranty. The cost of video storage is huge. When you record it already, we already have terabyte upon terabyte of video storage just from our in-car. Wait till we have body cameras. The, the video footage is astronomical. Uh, to, working with Steve Dion in IT, we didn't have the, the server capacity to store all this video. It's gonna take quite an upgrade and we're doing that as part of this project here and there's $120,000 budgeted for this to add 424 <coughs> terabytes of storage for all this additional video. Um, the cost of processing FOIA requests, yeah, we do a lot of, we have multiple people in our records department that do nothing but process FOIA requests. It's time consuming, but wait till video, body camera video comes because if you're inside someone's house, someone says something that's protected, um, something that needs to be blurred out, something that needs to be deleted from the video, that has to be manually done frame by frame. That is a clerk at a desk for hours scrubbing a video so it can be released through FOIA. It's gonna require an additional person, but with, I said, the Kronos benefit, we just went to Kronos Electronic Timekeeping here in Sterling Heights, which has been great. We no longer do three-part carbon time-off slips over time slips. It's all done on the computer now. We had two clerical people in my building that did nothing but process time cards. Paper, paperwork, three-part carbons, that is gone. So it freed up a body, and we're gonna free up one of those bodies, one of my clerical, and we're gonna make them a FOIA, an additional FOIA person, and able to handle some of these FOIA requests as they come in for body camera footage. And I think in the beginning stages, that should be able to handle our increased uh, calls for FOIA and the ability to scrub out those videos. Uh, privacy concerns with the public, this has been pretty well documented now. We're not the first agency uh, where there's many agencies that now have body cameras. And basically if there's a, um, police officers have the right, if the police officers have the right to be there, we have the right to be filming. Now, certain things before we release them through FOIA will have to be redacted because of privacy concerns, just like our in-car camera footage and our microphones that picked up sensitive information, private information, medical information, healthcare information, that all had to be redacted. There's no, nothing different with body cameras. There's well-established case law. We have the city attorney who's very versed in this, and if we have any question, we'll go with them before we release something sensitive. So we know um, how to handle the privacy concerns. And union issues. Back in 2016, the unions did not want body cameras. Most police departments did not want body cameras. The tide has changed, and we now see videos that completely clear uh, and vindicate the officer of wrongdoing. We had a, the famous case in Detroit just a few weeks back, um, and people thought that uh, someone was shot with no reason behind an unarmed person. That day, Chief Craig in Detroit released the video literally that day, which is unheard of in law enforcement. He released the body camera footage that day as protests started uh, building up throughout the day, and it showed clearly the suspect pulling a handgun from his waistband, turning and aiming at the police officers as he was shot. So again, body camera footage, priceless in that situation. We're seeing more and more video like that. Policing is a difficult job, and lately in the last few months has been really difficult. Police officers are forced to make split-second judgments in circumstances that are tense, uncertain, rapidly evolving. And when we use use of force, there is a Supreme Court case that governs all of our use of force, and that's Graham versus Connor. 
1989 case, and basically what that says is when you judge use of force, was that force appropriate, you judge it in the mindset of the officer in that moment, in that split second, and you don't judge it based on watching a video loop in slow motion a hundred times over after knowing all the facts of the circumstances. The Supreme Court said, if you place yourself in that officer's body for that one second when he decided to take that action, would a reasonable person have done that? Not based on, oh, now I know that there wasn't a real gun, or I know that he was running because of this. It's what did the officer believe at that exact moment? And now with body camera footage, we'll be able to precisely get into the mindset of the officer and what he saw at the moment. This is our body camera that we're going with. This is from a company called WatchGuard based out of Dallas, Texas. They were just bought by Motorola. We've been with WatchGuard since 2014. Uh, they were way ahead of the game with technology and they still have been. So we're going with WatchGuard because we can add their cameras, their body cameras to our current in-car setups. Um, it'll be seamless in our back end, the server, the way we pull up our videos, it just works. We're gonna be going, uh, Mark, if you go back one, the camera on the left, um, has a little uh, display on top. The lens actually rotates up and down. Um, when the officer turns on his lights in his car, his, his overhead lights, the camera automatically goes into record mode or the officer can just simply push the button right in the center of the camera. Um, you can flip to the next screen there. And that is the entire package. So when you say what costs $5,800, well, the DVR is on the bottom. That is a hard drive and a computer, that bottom piece, that uh, display module with the touch screen that gets mounted inside of the car. The camera gets mounted on the windshield um, that is right behind the rear view mirror, and then the body camera would be the last piece of the puzzle. The timeline, we have 60 to 70 vehicles that need new in-car systems because they're all out of warranty, so all of our cars have to be updated. Uh, so we have to get 60 to 70 of these units. Uh, we're gonna do 19 cars right now. Um, 10 of our brand new police cars, we're ordering 10 new cars with this current July 1st budget. We have 10 cars coming. Those cars will all be installed with the brand new WatchGuard video system with body cameras. And we're also gonna be buying um, five, uh, those 10 cars plus nine uh, existing cars will be upgraded to have body cameras. So 19 cars will have the ability to do body cameras. We're buying five additional body cameras themselves. So if we have two man cars, the driver and the passenger can both have body cameras on them and we have a spare. We're gonna apply for a federal body-worn uh, camera grant that comes out every year in March. This will be open again, hopefully, if the money's there. And we'll get about $2,000 per unit. So as we move forward and buy another 50 units, that's what we're probably gonna need. 50 units times $2,000, it's $100,000 worth of grant. And I don't wanna pass that up, that's why we're waiting a little bit. And to be honest with you, to get 19 cars up and running is gonna take us three to four months minimum to get those cars outfitted. Uh, so after that, the remaining 50 body cameras, uh, we're gonna wait for the July 1 budget year next year to finish out this project and buy the rest of the equipment with the federal grant. So with that, I'll welcome any questions anyone has. Okay, thanks Chief. What we'll do is um, we'll ask for participation from the audience first and then after they go, while the council's deliberating, I'm sure there'll be some questions for you and we'll call you back up then. So thank you very much. Uh, Chief Dojkowski for the presentation tonight. Is there anyone else in the audience tonight who would like to speak on this item? If not, Council, we need a motion. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Radke. Bear with me, it's a little bit long. <laughs> Resolved to purchase 10 WatchGuard 4RE in-car video systems, 14 WatchGuard Vista HD wearable body cameras, software licenses and software and hardware maintenance and warranty services from WatchGuard Inc. 415 East Exchange Parkway, Allen, Texas 75002 at pricing available through the state of Michigan My Deal, MI Deal Cooperative Purchasing Contract number 171-18000001059 at cumulative cost of $117,166.37 and Purchase Dell servers, storage drives, Microsoft software and licenses, and professional installation services from Access Interactive LLC, 4665 Magellan Drive, Novi, Michigan, 48377, at pricing available through the Midwestern Higher Education Commission Cooperative Purchasing Contract, number MHEC-07012015, at cumulative cost of $120,536.50, and C, authorize a budget amendment in the amount of $120,536.50 from general fund reserves. Support. It's been moved and supported. Is there any discussion, Mr. Radke? Yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you. 
I just want to say thank you, Chief, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, through the chair, I have just a few questions for you. Thank you, Chief. Um, just briefly, uh, I think this is wonderful. I'm, I'm fully in support of body cameras. I, I've talked with a lot of our officers. I know some of them are, are very supportive of this. I know the community is very supportive of this. But I'm curious what the policies are that are going to undergird the system that we have. You mentioned earlier that when the lights, uh, the light bar is activated, that the cameras will automatically turn on. Yes. And will officers then have to also turn it on if they make contact with someone from the public, for example? Will that be a policy? Yes. Our current system right now is a camera that's mounted inside the windshield, and there's a belt-mounted microphone, so very similar. The policy now states when you have any contact with a citizen, you will activate your belt-worn microphone. It'll now say your camera, your body-worn camera. Um, any, when you have a personal conversation, officer to officer, that, that will, it's just like it says now, do not record private conversations with mm -hmm. officers. They have nothing to do with police work. Um, and again, the cam when you turn your overheads on, the, the body camera automatically turns on. Um, so that will all be dictated in our general order, our policy and procedure for the camera system. And this will eliminate the microphones that they currently carry on their belts? Yes. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Will it be mounted center chest? Or I saw in the, the, the uh, background some of them were mounted on the side of their shoulder or whatever. I've seen them everywhere. They have a really great magnetic mount system that goes under your shirt so you can literally clip the, the camera to your chest pocket your top shoulder, center chest. And the great thing about our camera system, if you mount it up high and it kind of tilts back, the camera lens rotates down so you get your frame of view at eye levels instead of pointing up at the ceiling. Wonderful. I know there are some concerns by our officers. Also with this program is uh, it'll record after the fact. We can go back if, for example, a, uh, an incident wasn't recorded for whatever reason, we can go back and, and save the data. And I'm curious, how long does that data save for if we can go back and reconstitute a video if we didn't take one to begin with. Yeah, so WatchRoad has got great technology. It's called record after the fact, just like you said. So in our current system, if an officer did something in his car and said, oh my God, I think I saw that guy two days ago on patrol, but he didn't have a system on recording, he can actually go back into his car. And for about a week, we store almost every hour of footage that that car has for about a week because there's enough uh, gigabytes on the hard drive. And we can go back and record uh, an, an incident from three days ago. The body-worn cameras are a little bit different because the hard drive inside those little tiny cameras are pretty small. It'll retain the video probably for one or two shifts after you're done. So we could, so if you say, oh my God, I, I saw that or something happened, but you don't think about it until after your shift or the next day, we could probably go back into the server and cut out that section of video we're looking for off the body-worn camera. But besides, so here's the problem is the next officer checks out that camera, Maybe it's a day or two days there. As soon as the next officer puts it on his shoulder, wears it for 10 hours, it records 10 more hours of video, which then starts overwriting what was already on there. So you have about a day or a shift or two after that officer wears it to go back to find something. What will our policy be for saving the, uh, the video? Will it be one week, one month? I assume any incidents we're going to keep until the court case is over. Yeah, so uh, 90 days is our typical video, just like we have in the car right now. Michigan uh, Records Keeping Act it mandates around 90 days. That's what we have. That's what most agencies have around us. Some, some agencies have 30 days. We've kept our video for about 90 days. If it's something involving an arrest or some high-profile incident, that video we call it gets locked. We lock the video. is forever on our server. It doesn't go anywhere. And I guess there's a curious, uh, there's a, some thoughts about this. In Detroit, they actually, supervisors go back and use the cameras to audit officers. Will our department be doing that with these cameras? We have that process in place right now. Officers can go down and randomly on there, we can do it at their desktop now because it's all digital. They can literally go on and randomly pull up any video to see how officers are doing, critique a moment, a traffic stop or an arrest. They could do this as well in the policy. Um, it won't be to catch anyone doing anything bad. It would be random audits uh, with random officers, and we'd work with the union to make sure that was fair, open, transparent as possible, so no one feels that they're, they're you know, being messed with or you know, scrutinized unreasonably. Well, thank you, Chief. Uh, that's wonderful, and I, I fully support this. Thank you so much. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. All right. Thank you, Mr. Radke. Council, anyone else on this item? Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Sorowski. Um, so yes, uh, Chief, you can sit. It's fine. I'm, I'm just going to make some comments, but thank you very much. I do agree with uh, Mr. Radke that this is definitely, it's time. And, you know, we've heard a camera is worth a thousand words, but the placement of that camera is what's most important. And yes, I think that this is going to be the most fair, the most transparent, and the most equitable 
form of videotaping that we can ever provide it, well, provide it with the technology that we currently have. Uh, cameras from a distance may not capture everything, but cameras up close are, are much better at that. So I think it's 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 wonderful protection for both the officers and the situation that is ha that has occurred, whatever situation is occurring. It gives us the most up to date, most accurate information that we can use. So I'm very much in favor of this. I'm glad that we're doing it now. I see, you know, in my per, my world, I don't think this is that expensive considering what it's going to absolutely give us. So, um, and and then from, you know, my family's perspective, because a lot of them, you know, the, my husband and my son are both in court. This is excellent information. This is evidence. This is very indisputable, or it can be indisputable. It's, it's just, it is what it is. Um, it can be interpreted obviously in sometimes different ways, but it's great information and great uh, tool for us. So I, I'm thrilled that we're able to do this now. So I have full support of this. So thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Mrs. Sorowski. Anyone else, council? I will just say as well that uh, I want to thank you, Chief, for the presentation tonight and uh, for the information, uh, we think that this is a great police department and uh, we appreciate your leadership, uh, but know that these are challenging times for our community and for our police officers. And uh, so we, we know, I know that I have full confidence in you and in our police department. Um, and uh, we hope that these uh, body worn cameras will uh, add a layer of transparency that's helpful, uh, not just for our community, but for our police officers as well. So. I will be in support of this and look forward to monitoring how these uh, body-worn cameras impact policing in Sterling Heights going forward. So with no further discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Motion carries. Move on to the next item tonight, which is 8B, and that is 7C or 7G from the consent agenda to award a bid for snow removal services at municipal sites through May 1st, 2021 expenditure of $376,953 based on estimated number of snow events. Is there anyone in the audience who'd like to speak on this item? If not, council, we need a motion. Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Srowski. Resolved to award the bid for snow removal services at municipal sites to Kazar Management LLC PO B Box 661 St. Clair Shores, Michigan 48080 through May 1st, 2021, based on unit prices bid and authorize the city manager to extend the bid term to additional one year periods under the same terms and conditions. Support. It's been moved and supported. Is there any discussion? Um, yes, thank you, Mayor Taylor. Mrs. I, yes, thank you, Mayor Taylor. Um, so I, I do think that we, and I understand that we have um, had this single bid for this particular service. I do have a bit of a concern, and that is, although it is, this is I think why it has been brought off the agenda from by Mr. Radke, that we are extending the bid term to additional one year periods under the same terms and conditions. I would actually, and I, I, I would, I, I think that this is not the best opportunity for us to maybe there will be somebody else that would bid on it next year and we would have comp competing bids so i'm not sure that this is the best opportunity for us but that's my thoughts right now thank you mr rowski council anyone else mr mayor mr radke thank you mr mayor uh, thank you uh mayor pro temp Sarowski. i brought this this item off the consent agenda because i have uh, some concerns about this contract uh, I had the same concerns last year, and they've only been exacerbated by, I guess, COVID-19 in the additional year. Um, I was hoping that Mr. Carafel was here, Mr. Vanderpool. And, oh, I didn't see you in the back there. Yeah. Through the chair to Mr. Carafel, some questions about the contract. Come on up, Mr. Carafel, and we'll be... Um... Didn't recognize him with the mask on. <laughs> I know, it's a ways back there, too. <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good, so good to see you, Mr. Carey Fell. I, I still uh, miss you. I, it's, it's like a big change. He used to sit over there, so now you're over here. But um, 
my concerns about this contract are kind of several, several fold. One, uh, twice now, uh, KSAR Inc. or KSAR Management LLC was the only bidder who met all qualifications on this contract. Both last year, there was two bidders, but one of them only bid on some things. This year, KSAR Management was the only bidder. Uh, we took this out of the, the city employees and we bid it out because the idea behind bidding usually is that we'll get competing bids and that will drive the price down and that will save our city some money. But what has happened over the last two years is neither one of them have been competitive bid. So I guess I'm curious, how is this saving the city money? Uh, we used to have city employees do this. What is the savings, I guess, I would ask you? Well, I, I think if you look at... Uh the, the Department of Public Works. We've got a $30 million building. We've got multiple, multiple uh, trucks that are worth thousands of dollars. When we buy a new truck, $150,000 to $300,000 for a plow truck. We're essentially hiring a mini DPW to come in to do this work for you. Department of Public Works, I understand, doesn't have the personnel. They focused on other areas. So w our option is to contract out, which we do in many different areas. Um, it's, uh, it's a service that's available, and you're essentially hiring, uh, it's, 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 it's a mini DPW. This contractor has to have probably $2 million in equipment available on an as-needed basis. Um, in the summertime when you have uh, a mowing, they know they're going to have, the grass will grow. We don't know if it's going to snow, and we don't know how much. It could snow. Uh, a one inch, three inch, six inches, or ten inches. They have to be able to handle that size of, of, of snowfall and service and get it done on a fairly quick basis. So um, are we saving money? It's always hard to tell, but we are essentially hiring uh, many DPW on an as-needed basis. Have we compared their quote uh, that they gave us with other cities who contract out, not with just case our management, but contract out snow removal services like ours? We haven't really uh, done it because they are a little different. Lots are different. Um, I can tell you that uh, last year there were two bidders. One bidder who only bid on part of it was 2.5 times higher than this particular contract. Um, we would like to have more bidders, but the size of this contract and the, and the amount of work we have, it's very difficult. There are not many bidders out there that can do this work. And uh, to do it successfully, KSR has done it for now three years, and uh, they are offering to do it for potentially another three more at a set fee. Um, you know, after reviewing all the, the, the single bid, um, you know, we believe the best option is to renew this or to, to award the bid. Now, we had a number of vendors who did look at it. More than 200 vendors were aware of it, of, of this bid. 28 of them downloaded it. Of those 28, about 20 were really valid bidders who were uh, landscapers in this kind of business. The problem is, I think a little bit is, it's only a one-year contract, and a, a contractor needs a little bit of security. That's sort of what we're fighting a little bit with this. On a long-term basis, we may need to look <clears throat> at longer-term contracts to attract more bidders. They're going to invest this kind of money in, a, in an operation. They need some security. And that's probably one of the biggest things we have to deal with on the future basis of, of these bids. So I guess what's hard for me is we're, we're, we're authorizing up to 300, um, I lost a number here up to 300 something thousand dollars. But last year they didn't even reach that threshold because there weren't, there weren't as many snow events, correct? Based on snow events, right. correct. The amount of work. If it's a light winter, it could be less than $100,000. If it's a heavy winter, it could be uh, in the range of what we looked at, $370,000. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping for a light winter. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, and in the past, we had DPW do this, this work, and we've gotten out of the business. So we've sold all of our, our, our uh, plow trucks and things that we use for this specifically. We've not acquired new ones. Or, I guess I'm curious if we could take it over. I, that's, that's what my thoughts are. If we took it over, we'd have to buy more equipment or new equipment. I, I think that's a question better for DPW. Yeah. I, oh, uh, Mayor, I could interject on, on this question. Uh, <clears throat> just by way of history, uh, the city uh, decided to contract this out 
uh, not necessarily um, to save money, although we are saving money. When you look at the cost of uh, an individual to uh, drive a truck in this contract and, and compare it to one of our public works employees and the equipment we have, we our hourly rate is much higher, our benefits are much greater, and, and our equipment arguably is in much better condition. So there's no question it's more expensive for us to do this service. This, these are parking lots only. Uh, that's, that's all this contractor is doing. When our city employees did this, we realized that our priority was roads. We needed every conceivable resource we have, every employee we have in DPW devoted to roads. That's the highest priority for this community. Our residents and businesses expect that uh, they're going to get top-notch service on our roads. And since we've contracted out our parking lots, we've been able to devote more employees that are highly trained, well-paid, with very good equipment to roads. And if you've noticed over the last couple of years, we've been able to get through our snow events uh, throughout the community on roads much quicker, in large part because we don't have those employees working in city parking lots. So this has actually proven to be uh, very advantageous for the city. I understand the concern with the uh, two one-year renewable uh, option years, but that does not mean we're going to extend. We'll rebid this uh, next year, but it provides us flexibility. If the bidding climate hasn't improved, we need a contractor to do this work, or we'll have to reallocate personnel from DPW to parking lots, which are obviously a lower priority than roads, and our roads will not be getting done in the, the high quality, ex, expeditious manner they're getting done now. So that's the basis behind this, and I just want to reiterate, as Mr. Cariofil said, uh, this is the, the increase in this contract over the prior year is 5%, uh, considering the climate, we don't think that's unreasonable. It, it's totally then based on uh, the amount of snow uh, incidents that we have. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Well, let's let Mr. Radke finish. Thank you. That's all I have for you, Mr. Carafel. I, I would ask, I would move to amend this, uh, this motion and extend the bid term one additional year are the same terms and conditions from two years. Okay, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Black a second. And Mr. Um, Mr. Curryfell or Mr. Vanderpool, um, w let me ask you, Mr. Curryfell, what impact do you think <laughs> canceling this bid tonight and going out to bid for a multi-year term would have on the number of bidders right now? Well, that's a good question. Um, mm -hmm. I can't predict. Uh, however, this is a large contract. It requires a lot of equipment. If someone was serious to bid on something like this uh, or was looking at expanding their operations, they would have to prepare two to three months in advance. Mm -hmm. um, you couldn't just <coughs> bid on this. If you look at the equipment list this contractor has, and you don't have it available, but there are seven or eight double axle tandem trucks. Mm -hmm. Looks like about 20 four by fours with plows, <coughs> six loaders uh, uh, with, uh, you know, a, a, a loaders for parking lots to move snow around. It's a substantial amount of equipment. I just don't know that there's a lot of bidders out there who have this, this capacity to, uh, uh, you know, to pick something up. It normally is going to take a number of months to prepare and get equipment personnel lined up. Um, that's my concern. We could rebid it. Definitely, we can rebid it, and we can get you a number uh, and come back in, you know, six weeks. It might not be the same number that we have. It could be lower. It might be higher. We might only have one bidder. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Curryfield. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Mrs. Koski. Thank you. 
through the chair to uh, Mr. Vanderpool or to Mr. Kariefel, whoever wants to answer it. Mr. Kariefel, I believe you made a comment when you were doing your um, presentation that prices are based on the term of the contract. In your opinion, would it be better, since this is a one-year contract, if next year we went out for bids and bid a three-year contract, would we get a better price, or did I misunderstand you? <laughs> so, so we have the ability uh, to lock in one, two, or three years tonight, a minimum of one year. And at our option, we can then renew years two and three. We can decide next year. Uh, uh, we can still look at, we can look at the market and decide next year whether we want to bid it back out and not extend, bid it back out, and then uh, um, uh, use those numbers, hopefully entice more bidders, and possibly it would be a longer-term contract. I think we could look at the vendors and perhaps look at what they're interested in, what would make them interested in bidding a longer-term contract. Would a three-year term contract? Wouldn't that be a better way to I mean, do yeah, this? Maybe it I mean, may tonight not we're getting one it's year. It's hard to tell. It's really hard to tell. Tonight we're getting one year, and allowing the city manager to extend if there's no bidders next year. But if there's a possibility that there might be bidders next year, could we not go out for bids again for a three-year contract to see what kind of bidders we receive? We, uh, we can definitely bid it on a couple options. We can bid it on a year one, year two, or year three, or a combined guaranteed three-year contract. We can definitely do that. That's what I would suggest that you do. Thank That's you. all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Koski. Anyone else, Council? You know, for me personally, I, I don't like the cost of this. I don't, uh, it's, there's some sticker shock there, but I've heard the, the discussion and I understand the, the rationale behind it. Um, we are getting close to the time of, uh, where we might be needing this. And, and I'm comfortable with this. I mean, this is in line with, with what we saw last year and uh, in years past. Um, I think maybe in the future, I would like to see if we can get creative in our bidding um, in, our, in our request for proposals to see if that entices companies to, to bid. But for this year, uh, I am, uh, I'm satisfied with this and I'm going to be voting in favor. Anyone else? Anything? Mrs. Zarco? Um, I'm going to um, ag agree with you. Um, thank you, Mayor Taylor. But I am going to agree with you. But looking at this right now, it's a need. And uh, I don't think that, certainly wouldn't want to go out for bids now, but I think the suggestions that were brought up is next year go out for uh, multiple years um, and, and to see if that attracts any um, new companies. But when I was listening to the numbers as to how many people, you know, businesses actually looked at this and then finding out that how many people applied for it, I guess I would question. Um, I would question why they were. Well, you know, other companies were interested. So um, that's all I have to say. But I am in favor of this this evening. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Zarco. Council. Anyone else? Uh, with no further discussion, Ms. Uh, Riska, can we please have a roll call vote? Mayor Taylor. Yes. Mr. Yanis. Yes. Mrs. Yarko. Yes. Mrs. Koski. Yes. Mr. Radke. No. Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. And Mrs. Sarosky? Yes. Okay, motion carries 6 1. Um, we will move on. Uh, well, that completes that portion of our agenda tonight, so we'll move on to communications from citizens. Is there anyone in the audience who'd like to speak on any item not on tonight's agenda? If, that, if not, we'll go on to reports from city administration. Okay, we do have one. Okay, Mr. Jefferson, come on up. <coughs>
Mm -hmm. Charles Jefferson Sterling Heights. Um, first things first, we had, a, we had a great resident who had a tragedy in his life over the week. And uh, on behalf of the uh, Sterling Heights residents, I wish them, I give him our uh, deepest condolences to uh, him and his family. <clears throat> now, on top of that, um, I'm a long time resident here in Sterling Heights, and I would like to offer an apology to the city council, the administration, police department, the fire department, DPW, all the workers of uh, the city, um, and to the community um, for what Mike Radke and Mayor Taylor done over the last week. Um, I offer you guys my deepest apologies on behalf of the residents here of Sterling Heights. For what you folks don't know is Mike Radke called a bunch of residents bigots. And in today's climate, calling people bigots could get people hurt, seriously hurt. That's not funny. We saw people today with the Inclusion and Diversity Committee giving the awards. Um, just because you may, these people may have a different opinion than you or whatever doesn't mean that they're bigots. That could be hurtful. Like I said, in today's climate, um, that could be really hurtful. Not only did he call you, the people of this community bigots, but he inferred that you people that sit up there on city council that has to work with him. I did not. How you know what I was going to say? <clears throat> that he inferred that the people who were up here on city council uh, was working in concert with the bigots. So we couldn't have the inclusion and diversity committee. What I'm asking tonight, and Mayor Taylor sat up there. And he didn't say anything. He came up and gave his second to the emotion <coughs> that it was working, people was working against them, them to, in order to work in concert with the biggest. So I'm offering tonight, I'm asking you folks of general counsel to ask Mike Raggy, how does you know, offer us up some kind of evidence that the rest of the people on council and these folks out here were working with bigots. And those people were bigots. See, this is, this is big. This, these people could come back and sue the city, and I hope they do. And I hope they sue for the moon and land somewhere in the stars. Oh, that's that's like tantamount to saying the, the N word. All right. Somebody said the N word to somebody. Thanks, Charles. Thank you. Okay. You you should apologize too, man. Okay, Charles. Thank you for the advice. I got the proof. We're good. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Charles. Who'd like to be next? Come on up, Miss Early. Good evening, Mayor, City Council members and residents. 
and Jasmine Early. First, I want to thank the city and the police department, the CAP group, and the CERT for the outstanding job that they did on no and, sorry, September 11 for the event that we had honoring the people who died that horrific day, um, supporting the law enforcement and supporting our president. We celebrated the first responders that survived that attack. We also, um, I also want to congratulate each one of the recipients for on the Diversity Award and the officer who saved that wonderful baby life. Um, congratulations to the chief for his retirement. I hope he can enjoy retirement, which sometimes is not that we get out of job, but we do more. Um, speaking about diversity, uh, I read the comments that Mr. Radke put on Facebook. And I want to remind you and ask you the favor. You swarm to represent all citizens. And that means respect to all of us. As elected official, it's disappointing that the mayor and Mr. Radke currently uh, disrespect the residents. We disagree in many things, but that doesn't mean you should go and call us bigot. You specifically call Sana Elias and Jasmine Early bigots. Is there? And we are not. Whether we agree with you to opinions, I respect you. I don't call you names. If you real read the rules and ethics in the resolution amending ethical principles for the city officials and employees, in item two, it says, ensuring public respect, in treating their office as a public trust, public servants should add so as to ensure the the reality and perception that government is conducted according to the highest principles of democracy with honesty, integrity, and a concern for justice and is therefore worthy of respect, trust, and support. By you making comments in social media, you are not just risking the honor and respect that we residents should have for the local government, but you also are risking what Mr. Charles said. I'm just asking you the favor. Your hate against me doesn't need to be spread in social media. Respect the residents. You don't have to mistreat them. We disagree. I support President Trump, and I'm voting for him. And I hope that when, when the ballots come out soon, people check their president. The, I mean, the candidates. Uh, all right, Ms. Early, what, what does this have to do with city so, business? So it had to do with you respecting the residents. It has been already sent to lawyers. A lawsuit is not something that the city needs, and it's not going to go to the city. It will go personally to the ones who have. Yeah, so that's my we point. Respect you're the you're talking so about please, personal, that is a city business. You're talking about personal, I'm reminding you to ensure the public respect for the residents, whether it is here in the meetings, whether it is in social media, no matter where we see each other. We, you owe us that respect as we respect you. Thank you, and have a nice week. Thank you very much, Mrs. Early. Anyone else under communications from citizens? Come on up, ma'am. Hello, my name is Tamara Watt. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of Sterling Heights, uh, first time at the city council meeting. Um, I wanted to thank uh, the mayor for uh, responding to several of my questions on our Facebook group. Um, I came here today initially to um, voice uh, support for body cameras worn by our 
Sterling Heights Police Department, and I'm very um, happy to see that uh, our police department, as well as the city council, agrees that that's a necessary step. Um, but I did want to make a few uh, comments as a concerned citizen um, that, you know, I'm, of course, mandating body cameras alone is not the only change that needs to be made in many police departments. I'm glad we're starting the groundwork in our own community, but I wanted to voice um, concerns um, for the citizens about uh, training. Uh, we would like to see more police training, uh, particularly on de-escalation techniques and how police officers can handle situations involving people that are displaying signs of mental illness. We'd like the police officers to have less lethal weapons easily at their disposal. <coughs> and that would be their first choice for choosing a lethal method. Um, we would like to see deferred funding um, so that we can use more trained mental health professionals to serve the city of Sterling Heights. Oftentimes, I think our police officers are being used uh, in situations that would be better served by trained mental health professionals and um, more criminal charges and harsher punishments for anybody on the police force that um, uses excessive force and recklessness um, by police officers on the job. So right now, you know, in this country, our tax dollars, they pay for tear gas, riot gear, defense against lawsuits, and rebuilding economies when people react to unjust treatment. I'd like to see Sterling Heights be as proactive as possible and focus on the treatment of people along with the creating transparency where it pertains to the police. And I think everyone in Sterling Heights will be better for it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Watt. Anyone else under communications from citizens? Not. I'll close that portion and we'll go on to reports from city administration. Uh, anything for tonight, Mr. Vanderpool? Nothing further, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Vanderpool. Mr. Kashubsky? Nothing tonight, Mr. Mayor. Council, any reports? New business? <clears throat> Mr. Mayor. Mr. Radke. Just to briefly get into all the silliness, you know, <laughs> I call you a bigot, Mrs. Early, because you are one. Okay. You've been indoors. Uh, sorry. Slow down. No, no, no. You, don't, you can't tell me to slow down, Mike. Sorry. <laughs> Listen, your personal opinions about Jasmine Early, God knows I've got them. I could write a book about them. But I don't think it's appropriate here. Just like it's not appropriate for Mrs. Early to get up there and start talking about nonsense on Facebook. Okay? It's ridiculous. Okay? If you guys want to go out and bicker and fight on Facebook, do it all you want. That's not city business. And it's, in my opinion, it's ridiculous to get in an argument here in a professional meeting back and forth. Nobody's mind is going to be changed about Mr. Radke based on something Charles Jefferson says or Jasmine Early says. And nobody's mind is going to be changed about Mrs. Early or Mr. Jefferson based on what me or you say. So I would say we don't need it tonight. We just don't. We had a good productive meeting. Nobody cares about bickering back and forth about who's the bigot and who's not the bigot. Okay, that's just my two cents. And whether she's a bigot or not, whether anybody is a bigot or not, we're not going to be using our platform to lob those sorts of insults and lob those sorts of accusations against other people. That's just my feeling. Now, the council can overrule me if it wants. It's fine, Mike. I'll drop but that. But I would say let's move on to something productive. No problem. Bickering with Jasmine Early, unproductive. <laughs> So I wanted to th thank again the Diversity Awards. It's a great example of what the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Commission could do even more of. And that's why we need that commission in Sterling Heights. The idea that the Ethnic Advisory Committee doesn't already do some of these things is belayed by the point that we just saw tonight. And it's a perfect example of, of just how much they can bring the city together. And this is not part of their original charter. This is not part of an ethnic group. This was something that they took on by themselves without having to have direction or a charter written by the city council because they saw a need for it and they saw that it was necessary. So I would urge my colleagues to continue with the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Commission and move forward. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Radke. Appreciate that. Anyone else? Mrs. Zarko. Mayor Taylor. Um, through the chair to Mrs. Riska, I just want to give you the opportunity to give us any updates on the uh, election, the absentee ballots, the um, drop boxes, 
um, and just tell us if there's anything that we can do to help you um, to make sure that you have a very successful turnout and a lot of workers and everything goes smoothly for the election. Ms. Riska. Yeah, so we are working on um, some some campaigning, um, you know, to recruit election inspectors and also to encourage our voters to use our um, seven ballot drop boxes that we have throughout the city. You'll be seeing um, some videos come out on that and some information on that. With regard to where we're at right now, um, we've issued, well, I, I first want to say we have a record number of registered voters in the city of Sterling Heights. We're at about 92,600, I believe. Um, and we have already issued 30,000 absentee ballots. We have not yet received our ballots, but we issued them in the system when um, we will be doing our first mailing of absentee ballots on September 24th. And through the chair, one more question. Um, I know that we're, Michigan is one of the states that's trying to have, uh, get the ability to count absentee ballots before election day. First of all, um, how successful is that movement we're in? Is there anything that we can do to help you move that along in legislature? So Senate bill, um, I believe it's 757. It was just approved by the Senate, so now it needs to go to the House, and that will allow clerks to not tabulate ballots, but do some preliminary processing. So that would mean um, opening the envelopes and then securing the ballots um, in a separate container so that on election day, we don't have the task of you know opening the envelopes and doing verification. Um, we're still, we're working with our, our, I sit on the Michigan Association of Municipal Clerks. Um, we are working with legislators now to um, push that forward and we feel um, pretty confident that it will move forward and that we'll at least be able to start doing some preliminary processing on AVs the Monday prior to the election. I mean, we're, we're really all concentrating on this particular election right now, but I know that next year there's gonna be one and the year after that. And I wonder what, um, if you could give us information on like, I wanna call, I don't wanna call it early voting, but actually that's what it is in other states. Um, if it's beneficial, if you can give us a report of how successful that is in other states, is it something that uh, you feel that we would need here in, in the state of Michigan? So those are questions that I would have is, and I believe that in the early voting, um, my brother-in-law lives in Florida, and I know for um, a month ahead of time, they have uh, a machine that's set up where they can go in and cast their ballot, and it's it's counted. I mean, it's it's early voting, and it's for a whole month, and it's in the fire station. So I just wonder if that's something we consider, and if you could give us a report on the pros and cons. That's yes, it. Yes, I will. Do that. Nothing further. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Zarko. Anyone else, counsel? If not, I would uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Support. The move is supported with no discussion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone.